basically this talk is about how you reduce friction uh, before starting that uh, i'm based out of new york and our office is really the one uh, so if all of you have seen spider-man far from home but right, if you haven't seen it uh, go watch it i'm not sharing any spoilers here i made sure of that if you have seen spider-man and if you haven't seen this screen that means you just walked out of the movie theater because this is after the credits, right, in between the credits. So our office is behind Madison Square Garden, which is that one. That's where I work. So if you step out, it's, it's that view, right? So, so that's where I work. Uh, so I basically had a hectic week uh, this, this time. I had to fly into uh, Brussels from JFK. And, and that was interesting. So I took an Uber from home to JFK and uh, basically went to the JFK airport, and I experienced this. So this is basically using facial recognition to uh, go through the boarding process. Right? So instead of actually scanning your boarding pass, uh, so you got the boarding pass, so we got the boarding pass, they scribbled the normal security stuff on that, as they usually do, random checks. Right? But, um, but then when you walk through, right? so when you walk through the boarding gate, and I was flying Delta, uh, so you, you just, walk up and I tried to scan the boarding card and they said, no, you don't need the boarding card anymore. Uh, just, just, just smile at the camera and then walk through. And it verifies you. So this is really connecting to the back end of the boarding pass. Uh, it's connecting to the back end of border control. Uh, it is checking whether your passport is valid. Uh, it's checking whether your visa is valid, I guess, I'm assuming. Right? Uh, but this was just done in October, so, so it's uh, quite, quite new. And uh, they're planning to roll this out in different countries as well. Right? Um, so that was, that's basically one example of being frictionless. Right? Uh, this is a concept that's coming up a lot. But uh, if you've seen all of the talks today, right, we're talking about APIs, how, how innovative APIs can be, how they can wrap all of the uh, underlying services, how they can expose services, how, how they can abstract these, so that people can start focusing on newer channels newer business models, uh, newer efficiency models, so on and so forth, right? Work very closely with partners, et cetera. So in essence, you're trying to make the consumer or the customer's journey frictionless, right? And that, that's what we're trying to do. And that's a key concept when it comes to anything, right? Even if you have like an API and if someone needs to sign up for an API and you're to complete like five steps to do that, that's friction, right? And you might as well go somewhere else to avoid that friction. Um, if you're signing a contract with WSO2, Right? And, and if we tell you, read this book, read all legal terms, take a month to sign that, that's a friction. Right? And one of the concepts of digital transformation is to get rid of that friction, make it frictionless. So this aspect comes into play everywhere. So from my journey at the airport, I went, I, so I took an Uber, right? so from home to uh, JFK, that was like a 45 minute drive in traffic. Uh, I could see where the people are, Right, so that, that was good. Uh, on my, from Brussels, I flew to Dubai. So I'm just flying in from Dubai yesterday. And that was my Uber screen in Dubai. And it was interesting. I noticed the one down there is a chopper option, right? <laughs> Only in Dubai. So <laughs> but that was interesting. I was, uh, this is tied to WSO2's corporate account. So when we book, so we have an Uber corporate account, right? So when we book vehicles, we, uh, it automatically goes, gets paid by finance. Uh, I was tempted to f try this, <laughs> I mean, because it'll go through, right? It's going to go through automatically. Uh, it's the corporate account, but then <laughs> it respond to the VP finance. But that's, inter that's interesting, right? So, so behind all of these are APIs, right? So Uber created this whole API-driven platform, the whole network effect, right? So you, you have partners who can join up as drivers, you, you have consumers who join up as riders, you have the network effect or the de supply demand effect happening real time, right? So, so let's say you have um, a little, few, few riders in the area, right? So you need to incentivize the riders, so you drop the prices, you incentivize the riders. Uh, then the drivers need a different type of incentive. They need higher prices, right? So you increase the price and that incentivizes the drivers to join the loop. So there's this network effect. Uh, when Uber started pitching the idea some time back, uh, it was a Y Combinator, uh, I can't remember the exact name, someone from Y Combinator, Yahoo, uh, 
uh, who drew this famous network diagram, right, which talks about real-time networks, and that led to one of the most successful platform business models. But behind all of that are APIs, right? And that's, that's what all of our discussions were about today. That's what the panel discussion was about today as well. It's reducing friction through these cool concepts called APIs. And no doubt about it, right? APIs are really cool. It's, it's, it's allowing you to create all these technologies. But what's the flip side of that? So the flip side of that is exploiters think that APIs are cool as well. Right? So compared to 10 years ago, where everything is like, OK, so monolithic applications, underlying services, you basically secure those services. Uh, you're not really exposing these services externally. Right? If you're going to expose them, there's maybe a partner who talks via a VPN. Right? Everything's controlled. But now we are thinking everything as APIs. Right? So we are exposing certain services as internal APIs, exposing certain services as external APIs, some for partners, some for customers, some for consumers. Right? So, but we are thinking in APIs. So we are thinking like, OK, I have this data set. How do I expose this? Right? That's, that's relatively what we are thinking about. Right? So that's now opening doors all over the place, which is why security is a key aspect. And there's really nothing wrong with the API technology part, if you think about it. Right? So you have designed APIs. You have a really, really good protocol. Uh, in o Auth2, you have additional stuff under OpenID Connect. You have the JWTs, which you can pass with different attributes. So you have the building blocks in place. But even with that, there are many exploits going on. Right? On a daily basis, some small, some pretty large. Uh, you remember Chris's presentation. Chris had a diagram of the different exploits. Right? The, and it has been increasing from 2010. And one of the things that has been changing from 2010, obviously, is that data is getting exposed as APIs. All of these examples uh, here, this is just a few, are actually API exploits. Right? So uh, Dan Salmon is the one who actually did the Venmo exploit. And so he wrote a blog post saying, I, this is how I exploited it. Uh, this is basically Panera Bread. Right? So Panera Bread, huge chain in the US, the restaurant industry. They basically exposed APIs so that their devices can talk to those APIs. But it also happened to have credit card information if you do a certain type of operation. Right? So security was right, but there were certain pieces missing. Um, Instagram is one example. Amazon, there was a breach in 2018. Uh, United States Postal Services, there was a huge breach. So that was basically for a year, there was a breach of like 60 million records. Uh, anyone could go in and call the API. And then if you change the ID, it will return privacy information about someone else. Right, so you just add random IDs. The fix for this was quite soon. Right? So once someone reported it and once it was escalated, the fix was like two minutes. So it's not a technical thing. It's a process thing. And it's not a problem with the technology around APIs. It's a process around how you expose these APIs, how you secure those APIs. Right? So, so that's imagine a house. Right? You have a house. You have like the most advanced security. You have like. Alexa and all of these stuff, and you basically use your mobile phone to see what's happening in the house, uh, and you leave the front door open. Right? So, so that's, that's APIs. APIs are your front door. And if you have like some sort of a way that exploiters can get in, that's your weakest link. Right? So, so this is, sorry for being a buzzkill, right? APIs are cool, but then you need to for, uh, for a look at security. Uh, this is a, a good way of thinking about it. So, so we talk about APIs being the connective tissue of any organization. right? You have your services. You think via APIs. You expose these APIs. Uh, so attractive target for threat actors, because it's the glue linking the different services. right? So you simply focus on APIs. And basically, it allows data to flow from one location to the other. So you're thinking about data APIs as well which in the past was just, let's say, a JDBC call from a specific service that's limited to that service. You now have a lot of implementations where the actual data is exposed as a RESTful SQL to the different services. Right? And in certain instances, this data is exposed externally as well. So you are exposing internal data as well to the external world. Right? So that's the seriousness of, of that aspect. So, OK, so that's the bad, bad part. Right? So how do you fix this? So again, it's not an issue with APIs. Right? API-driven businesses are going to increase. That's the way to stay relevant. That's the way to be cutting edge. That's the way to compete uh, 
in, in this challenging landscape where there's like lots of unicorns popping up. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the identity access management side in APIs. Right? So you have the API security part, which is the last point there, the API token security. Uh, the first part is, of course, how do I onboard different developers, different customers, different API developers, application developers, etc. Right? That's an important point. So if you are going to work with external developers, application developers, and if you expect them to also collaborate, make the platform successful, and then build newer businesses around that, you need to make this process seamless. If you don't make the process seamless, then again, friction. So people will turn to some other place, or they will just avoid the whole problem and, and, and do something else. right? So how do I seamlessly onboard these kinds of developers, organizations, enterprises? That's my first problem. Uh, authentication, of course, who is using my API? Right? And there's different ways of handling authentication. You have the uh, standard Open ID Connect ways. You have single sign-on. So someone basically is using an application. They single sign-on. They come in. The API gateway should ensure that the tokens are valid and the tokens are translated, all of that. Uh, what can they then do with authorization? Uh, so basically, what can they do with the API? Initially, when the API concept started coming out, API is really focused on the authentication part. Right? Who am I? And here's the API. So now we are starting to think about the authorization part. So who am I? Here's the API. Can I really ac execute this specific action in the API? And then maybe a, st a step further, can the backend really allow you to execute this action? Right? So the different levels of authorizations. And then when you're authenticated and you're authorized, in the API world, you get a token. This token is short-lived, it's long-lived, it's different types of tokens. This token basically represents the two of these right? in the API world. Now, what do you do with the token? What happens if the token is compromised? What happens if the, there's fraud around the token? What happens if someone had access and now they don't have access? Right? So that's all the parts to do with token. So it's a wider view for you to think about. Right? So it's, it's basically identity access management, API security. There are different layers of doing things, but you have to start thinking about this. So we'll start with onboarding. Uh, crowded diagram. So I'm not, I, I don't want you to focus on the diagram, but what this really shows is you basically have central systems, like maybe a CIAM, you have an API management system. You have consumers on the northern part of that, so you have applications. You need to onboard application developers. You need to onboard consumers. But then you have like your systems, your properties, maybe your hotels, your, your flight systems, et cetera which need to connect to this as well. And that's an onboarding challenge as well. These systems have their own identity access management problems. They have their own APIs. So you need seamless ways of onboarding all of them. So onboarding becomes a, a big picture problem, which you need to make very seamless. Right? Uh, in the API manager, if you've seen that, we have like the self sign up screen in the API manager. So if you want to onboard yourself onto a developer portal, you get the self sign up screen. Uh, in this specific one, someone has added uh, a custom attribute as well. So you can keep adding custom attributes. Uh, and, and so there are different systems, different ways of signing up. Right? But again, maybe friction. Right? So if, if you expect hundreds of developers to sign up in your system, and you give them the sign up screen and say, enter all your information, create a username, password, that's good. It's a first step, but it's friction. Right? So how do you avoid friction there? you basically ask them to bring their own identity into the system. And this is true with API developer portals, any, any application, even mobile applications. right? So people already have Facebooks. They have Google accounts. They trust that already. So you allow the system, the broker, whatever technology, to allow them to use that. Right? So you just say, I have a Facebook account. I'm going to use that. And this needs to broker that or federate that. Right? So it's quite simple to have the API gateway or API management system connected to an identity broker, like the identity server, or any technology, and then allow that to federate. One of the interesting projects we did some time back was to use telco identities. So we, we talk about Facebook having billions of users, which is good. But if you are, a, 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 let's say, a Vodafone user, O2 user, right, or, or uh, AT&T or whatever, they have like thousands of millions of subscribers already. And you've been using your telco service for a long time. So who better to authenticate you than a telco? Uh, so there's one GSMA project we worked with where uh, 
use similar to this, you can also point to a telco, and that telco, sorry, this is coming off. Yes. So that telco will then send you an SMS saying, hey, you're trying to log into eBay, uh, allow. And then you just click on your phone itself via the SMS, and that authenticates you in. So it's like passwordless authentication. So that's reducing friction. But moving beyond that as well, moving beyond standard authentication, we've heard about the multi-factor authentication, step-up authentication, multi-step authentication, uh, device-based authentication, so on and so forth. Right? This is common. I'm not going to go into this, but what you're saying is step, uh, one step further from normal authentication to make it more secure and authenticate you based on what, who you are, what you have, what you know, different factors. Right? And, and that's quite simple to authenticate. Again. If you have the API developer portal, you federate it to an identity system, which can basically do this. I'm picking on identity server again as an example, but most any identity system should be able to do this. But bottom line here is you cannot think of API management as just this single product that you download and expect that to do everything. Right? API management is a bigger problem, which includes multiple components. So multi-factor authentication, pretty simple, straightforward. Uh, but what's the next step? Authentication needs to be dynamic, it needs to be context-specific, and it needs to be responsive. Right? And that is adaptive authentication. So instead of just providing an authentication scheme and telling people, like, you need to enter your username password, and you need to use a FIDO device or a, a mobile phone to authenticate with the next step, you do it based on ex an example, based on context. Right? So one example. Uh, geo-velocity-based authentication, adaptive authentication. So imagine this. So, so I'm, I'm in US, right? So I'm ac accessing uh, my Bank of America account in US, right? So that's pretty straightforward. The browser can detect that I'm in US. The API can detect based on my IP I'm in US and provide you with a screen, which is simple authentication, right? So username, password. Uh, or if I'm on my mobile phone, it's, it's a face, face authentication using Apple ID, right? So simple enough. Now I move to Brussels, 20 hours later, or like 10 hours later, I'm logging in to Bank of America from Brussels, which sounds fishy, but it's, it's a practical scenario, right? I did travel. Uh, so if this is integrated to the travel system, it will already know. Uh, so it's not. So what, what basically will happen is it detects that I'm from a different IP. I did log in from a different IP just 10 hours ago. So now it's going to ask for a second factor, which is, give me your mobile number, or, or authenticate via a device, or authenticate via uh, Google, or so, something. Right? Something that's a second factor just to validate uh, that it's still you. So that's an adaptive type of authentication. It's not a single static two-factor authentication. You're adapting to the situation. So that is less friction. That has less friction than just saying, each time you want to log in, you need to put these two or three factors. Right? So it's frictionless. Um, Maybe another example, uh, basically, is if you're authenticating via, let's say, to an e-commerce site. Right? OK, it authenticates via my uh, Google account, and then it allows you to go in. But if I'm now going through a bank site, and it's still single sign-on, right? so let's say, uh, let's say it's part of a banking ecosystem. There's just a, sh uh, a reporting page, and that's a single social login. But now I'm accessing the page which has my accounts. And then it detects it's a higher level of single sign-on that is needed, and it steps up the authentication. So it checks the level of assurance. It's called LOA. And it steps up the authentication and now tells me to enter a second factor to authenticate. So it's still the same single sign-on session, but it now, based on the application, requires a higher factor to authenticate. And the API ecosystem in the background need to, needs to adapt to that, needs to be aware of that as well. So in WSO2 Identity Access Manager, so we've been talking about API Manager and API Gateway and so on and so forth. But in the Identity Access Manager, we've added certain features to support this. right? So, so one is basically the adaptive authentication policies. So you have out-of-the-box policies. You have wizard-based view of uh, configuring these policies. There's a JavaScript-based scripting engine to configure policies as well, so it, which makes it much easier to write very complex policies at that level. There's a diff there are different types of authentication uh, connectors that we have as well that can be used. But one core principle also is that we've made all of our components extensible. Right? It is open source, yes, you can go underlying, to the underlying code base and configure it, but we made it extensible. So we have 
multiple customers out there, right, like the Starbucks of the world, the Hiltons of the world, etc., who have actually extended the Auth2 protocol itself. Right? Because based on your organization, based on your requirements, based on your infosec requirements, maybe the standard Auth2 is not, uh, not, is not satisfiable. Right? You need that extra level of protection. Maybe you need HMAC as, uh, as an additional layer. You, maybe you need to uh, have some token fraud analysis at the Auth2 token layer. Right? So that, that basically allows you to extend the product. So in, in the Identity Access Manager, you have the static authentication flow, which is pretty simple. You have a request-based conditional authentication flow. So if the request is a SAML request, you do this. If it's an Open ID Connect request, you do this. If it's a, it's a you can have a user-based conditional authentication flow as well. So if the user is a trusted user who's been using the banking systems for five years, do this. If this is a new user and this is his first five attempts, do this, right? So in, in banking systems, we've seen the case where this is tied to a risk engine. So based on what the user is doing in different applications, there's a risk score built up. And then based on that risk score, the authentication system decides what to do around it. Right? And again, all of these should still be tied in to the API ecosystem. And then, of course, you have the adaptive part of it, adaptive risk-based authentication flow which is also then, which can take into factors like which application is calling this and which user of that application is calling this, et cetera. Right. So then, so that's the authentication part, that's the onboarding part, uh, you have the authorization part as well. But in the API world, what's unique is you provide these tokens. Right? So once you provide the tokens, the tokens live for a certain amount of time and the tokens represent some kind of authentication, authorization, uh, et cetera. Right? So that's where the rest of the things come up as well. So having the token validity, deciding how long a token is valid for, like whether it's just an hour, which is the default, which is uh, whether it's like a month-long token, whether it's a 15-minute token, et cetera. Uh, we have a bank, uh, one of the larger banks in the US, they do like 10-minute tokens, and they refresh the tokens. But then when you do that, there's a performance hit as well, right? when you continue to refresh tokens. So then you need to ensure that you can refresh a token be ahead of time, so that uh, you, can, uh, you can have a trade-off. Uh, HMAC is, a, is like a virtual hardware part of the token, so you, you basically have some kind of a signature of the application calling uh, the, the API at the back end, so that application has some kind of a signature. Uh, as I mentioned, you can extend all of these, so that, that helps. In the gateway itself, you have rate-limiting, throttling, spike arrests. Right? That's an important security criteria as well, if you come to think about it. Uh, in the gateway, you have uh, regular expression and XML, JSON threat protection. So you can configure like certain types of threats coming in. That's another security part. Uh, customers, uh, like there's the certain large customers, large ticketing customers, retail customers of ours, who do token fraud detection. So they do certain checks to see whether this auth token is still valid and whether it still belongs to this consumer. Right? Apart from all of this, so they do that fraud detection as a separate layer. It will be a performance hit, but then maybe it's something that is really required. Right? So, so that's the basis of this. So, so the summary of the discussion is that APIs are really cool. The API-driven world is moving at a very fast pace, and you'll just see more and more integrations, more and more applications, and frictionless services coming up. Right? But security must be part and parcel of all of that. It has to be a core component of all of that. And especially in, in this region, right? So imagine uh, with GDPR, now you have that USPS kind of scenario where you can access 60 million uh, personal information, like people information, and personally identifiable information of all of them. That's really expensive, right? That's legally expensive as well. So API security is, is key, especially with PSD2 and GDPR in play, and that's, that's again uh, another view of Chris's diagram, right? So from 2017 to 2018 to 2019, you see the number of exploits increasing, and if you actually go into this, uh, most of these are API-based, right? So, so it's very important to focus on the API part, to focus on the security part, and build security as an automated process, which is part of your API process. Right? So, yeah. That's, that's basically the gist of the talk.